Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Kemp webinar. This one, how to detect ransomware in your network. My name is Frank Yu. I'm the Principal Application Experience Architect. I deal with applications on the network and understanding how they work and how to optimize them in your environment. And I have with me a great special guest. We have Michael Murda. He's our business development manager for our Kemp Flowmon product line. And he has an extremely uh, deep uh, wealth of information that he's going to share with us today. Michael, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, Frank. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you and uh, nice, to, good to see you again, Frank. Yeah, uh, my name is Michael. I work as a business development manager at uh, Camp Flomon. And uh, I basically help our customers and partners across uh, the Nordics region and in France and also in Africa with their projects of uh, getting a powerful analytical tool and detection tool to, to strengthen uh, their networks and, and applications. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. And just real quick for everybody, a couple of housekeeping things. This uh, Bright Talk webinar is live, of course, and we will be recording it for On Demand later. And if you have any questions, please go to your question section in the Bright Talk interface, and we will be uh, going through and answering the questions at the end of this webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. So... How to detect ransomware in your network. This is a big problem and something that's uh, very relevant today because we hear about all these problems on the network and what's going on with uh, with these hackers, attackers, these uh, cyber criminals, whatever you want to call them. And you constantly hear in the news about people, companies having their computers compromised and what can you do? And a big answer to this is, Stop them before they even get to that point if you can, or at least identify that they're there. So we're going to be talking about some key things in terms of uh, how can we do things to really protect your network and identify these things and stop things from happening. So real quick, we're going to talk uh, briefly about what is ransomware, how it works. I'm going to go through some uh, common techniques and the process that hackers use to go and uh, attack your network in terms of ransomware, how they find these vulnerabilities and get through them and identify your network and things. And then we're going to talk about the Kemp Flowmon ransomware detection and response model and how it can benefit you to really protect and identify and protect your network. And then in the end, we're going to go through some questions that y'all present. And we'll talk about these things and see what we can do in terms of helping you identify specific things that you might have about this. So let's get through this. Number one, what is ransomware? And it's, and it's fairly simple. I mean, people hear about all the time. Ransomware is malicious software, is bad software that somebody is putting on your computer that is or computers, and it's designed to deny your computer access. And really what they're doing is they're really uh, extorting you. They're they're stealing your data or encrypting your data so you don't have access to it until you pay them. They're looking for money. They want to find a reason for you to want to unlock or pay for the stuff that you already have that they are now taking away from you. And they use different <coughs> excuse me, methodologies such as phishing, which is email targeting specific people, or finding vulnerabilities in your network and, and your systems to really get there. And ransomware is something that is common. It's everywhere and it's expensive. The average ransom is over $100,000. And these hackers use like uh, these cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. You have to pay so many Bitcoin, as you know, Bitcoin. The, the prices have been crazy up and down lately, but it's getting really bad in terms of how much it costs. And you can see that the average total cost, including your IT resources and everything else and recovering, it's $700,000 plus in terms of you protecting your network and, and fixing your network and also paying on the ransom if you end up paying the ransom, which a lot of companies actually do. The stat on this report from Sophos, State of Ransomware 2020, says that 51% of companies were attacked last year. You know, I always caveat that. You know what? Chances are there are a lot more companies that were attacked 
they just weren't aware that they were attacked or, or being attacked. And of these companies that were attacked, 40% paid a ransom. But here's another key pieces of information. These attackers use a lot of different techniques in terms of social engineering with these emails and phone calls and other things. And they use lots of vulnerabilities to look and find ways to get into your network so they can then start extorting you to, to get this money. And what this really shows is that we need to have a multi-layer defense system. We need to have a layer defense system where we can really detect and mitigate these threats at different points in the network, not just at your traditional points that you might be thinking about. To give you an example, in 2020, 2020 was a bad year for everybody for various reasons in terms of the, uh, the coronavirus and everything else. <clears throat> Australian shipping from toll group. They got hit by ransomware in 2020 in January, and they got infected by a piece of ransomware in January that shut down their system. And this ransomware that they were infected with was actually called NetWalker. And it shut down their network, shut down their infrastructure. The business basically went down for a certain amount of time, and they, over time, you know, fixed it after January. The crazy thing, the really crazy thing here is they got attacked twice in 2020. Later that year, in May, they got attacked again by a different piece of ransomware. They got attacked by what they call the Nephilim ransomware. And so they had to do this all over again because they got attacked twice. So this is a lesson learned. Protect yourself in advance if you can, but when you get attacked, then start implementing things immediately to protect yourself. And just very recently, just in the past couple of days, in the past week, in the United States, there's a company called Colonial Pipeline. They provide pipelines for, for gasoline and things for part of the U.S. They got hit by ransomware, supposedly by a Russian group called DarkSide. And it shut down their infrastructure to the point where the pipelines cannot carry the gasoline. So now gas prices are rising in the United States and the, and the government, the, the United States White House, the president, actually declared an emergency order to try to resolve this problem because of this ransomware. It's crazy how much impact ransomware can have if it gets into your network. You need to do something about it. So 90% of the budget is spent on prevention. We buy firewalls, we buy tools, we buy monitoring things. But the firewalls are at the edge. What happens when something gets through them? What happens if something gets to the gets into the email system? And how can we use detection and response technologies to detect this? What can we do? to identify these things when that firewall and these border protections we use get compromised or get bypassed. I liken the network to be like, I think of it, my analogy is a chocolate covered cherry. You know, those candies that you get in the boxes, especially in the US on Valentine's Day, you give them to your girlfriend or wife. And it's a hard chocolate shell and that's your security. But inside that hard chocolate shell, it's this gooey, sweet cherry, and it's liquid, and that's your network. And the way I look at it is you poke yourself past that hard chocolate shell, your security, and once you get past that security, all bets are off. You have access to that sweet, gooey cherry. You have access to your network, and there's almost no protections or detection internally. This is one of the big problems that we need to fix. And endpoint protection. So these these things that we put on our on our computers in terms of you know um, software for my Windows or Apple Mac uh, Mac systems and everything can be bypassed and evaded. We can there are threats like zero day threats. There are things that can always be found that can be installed. And on average, can you believe this? It takes 197 days to identify a breach, to identify that a system has been attacked. 
It is crazy. So it, these attackers, these bad guys, have more than half a year to play around on your network until you identify that this breach has occurred. So multi-layered security, when we talk about it, what do we mean when we say multi-layered security? We mean look at the different points in your network from perimeter, endpoint, internal network. And we look at the different methods and components of an attack and where and how we can detect these things in these different points in the network. And we want to talk about how this network detection and response can cover these aspects and contribute to providing more intelligence to these components in different parts of the network because it's really designed to help identify as well as complement other tools to really drive this process for you to ident identify these attacks in the network. So let's spend a little time and talk about these common hacker techniques for ransomware. Let's go through these steps quickly that we talked that we just showed in terms of exploitation, privilege access, discovery, lateral movement, collection, uh, command and control, exfiltration, and impact on you and your network and what they what it looks like. What are these, what is what are we seeing from the hackers' point of view? Number one, discovery. The hackers need to identify what your network looks like, what are your systems, what operating systems are you running. So they're going to run tools like maybe Nmap, which is a network discovery tool, or they're going to run probes to look at what ports are open on your systems and what type of OS are you based on the responses your systems are running so that they know what specific tools and functions they can use to really penetrate the vulnerabilities that they're identifying in your network and how they can jump from one network one part of your network to another and host the host. This discovery process is important for them. This is critical for them to really identify. And this is really a great place where you can use tools to discuss, to identify them probing and monitoring your network. The second thing they're going to do is once they find vulnerabilities, they're going to try to take advantage of them. Or for example, they're going to do password spraying. When I say password spraying, this is also called like a brute force attack where they're going to find a server that they want to compromise. And they're going to just attempt to log into it using this default password list. And we've seen the messages. We've seen the notes um, and, and the articles and everything and the alerts from all the security vendors, including us, including myself, to say, hey, don't use common passwords. Don't use password as your password. Don't use one, two, three, four, five, six, because they have a list of these passwords that are commonly used. And when they try to access a system, one of the first and easiest things they can do is try to log on using these pre-built lists. And these lists could be thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of commonly used passwords to try to act, gain access to these systems. And of course, once they get password access to the system using some sort of uh, um, user that has proper credentials, all bets are off. They now have the same rights as you to that system. So this is something that you need to be on the lookout for when you are monitoring your network and monitoring your system to try to see what's going on. Next, once they get access to one or two systems in your network, they're going to try to get more. And they're going to do this, what we call lateral movement. They're going to try to move from host to host within your network using other tools. For example, if you have a lot of Windows machines, using RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol, and try to remote desktop to these machines. And you might think, well, I'm protected because I'm using Windows Exchange. And by the way, there's been a lot of Exchange vulnerabilities recently announced and a lot of fixes for those. But... Here you can see, for example, there were, this was, I think, a, a year and a half ago, some zero-day bugs that let hackers bypass the login screen and just access remote desktop without any sort of credentials. So just because you think you're safe or you, just because you think it's on the inside doesn't mean you can let your guard up. 
you need to protect yourself and make sure you keep a strong security profile. And again, in terms of detection, you need to find some ways to see how are they moving inside your network. Once they're inside, those firewalls aren't going to be helping you anymore. How do you know that these hackers are moving from machine to machine? Next, they're going to do input capture. Key logging is the common thing that we see. They'll install some sort of software or monitor something using a remote desktop or something and start tracking what you're doing. They're going to be tracking your keystrokes. So they can see usernames, passwords, things, devices you're going to. They can do Windows screenshots so that they can identify more passwords and more things because they want to really extend the reach of what they have access to within your network. They really want to drive and own and control as much of the components in your network so that they have as much access as your IT administrators, as your users, as your sysadmins. So again, how can we identify these things? This, this is another component of their tools. This is another component that we need to think about on how can we detect and prevent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Exfiltration. What do I mean by exfiltration? They're going to be sending the data back to themselves. So they're collecting the data, for example, with key loggers. And they have this file on the system that they're hiding somewhere that has all this great information. They need to send it back to themselves so that they can see all the cool, juicy information that they are collecting. And you might think, well, I got my firewalls. My firewalls are protecting me on the outbound as well as the inbound. I feel pretty safe that they're never, never going to see this data. You know what? It's crazy. It's crazy how creative these hackers can be. For example, I can almost guarantee that you're not protecting DNS, UDP port 53, or ICMP, that ping, ping, a ping reply. So I ping host. You think, okay, these are very basic networking protocols, DNS and ICMP. They're innocuous. I'm not going to worry about them. And everybody needs them, so I'm going to make sure they're allowed. But you know what? These hackers can take this protocol and dump their data into that. So instead of just ping ICMP, where I'm, you can see here, receive packet from, sending packet to, receiving packet from, ping packets are typically very small, but I can fill that packet with lots of information. And I can send a lot of information within a series of packets so that your firewall never knows that I'm sending all of this information, and it could be gigabytes of data, out of your network using these protocols that are commonly used on the internet that you don't think or really don't have a method to detect and protect. So how do we identify that these things are being used? How do I identify whether this is a ping or a DNS request that is normal for a normal user doing something that he should be doing versus them stealing all your data and pushing it out or pushing it out of your network? We need tools to really understand what is going on and how they are sending this data out. And there's lots of other methods. These are not the only methods. There's lots of other methods they can use. So you need to be very diligent in looking at everything on your network. And the impact. What is the impact on you as a customer, as a business, as an IT organization? It's crazy. When we think of ransomware, the primary thing we're thinking of, you see, is getting the message on your computer, that dreaded message. Your files are encrypted. And unless you send X number of Bitcoin to this location or send me a message with your information, I am going to keep them locked and you're never going to access them again. And they do other things where they might steal your data and say, you need to pay me or I'm going to put it on the internet so that everybody can see. So all my dirty laundry, all these bad things or these interesting things or these things I don't want my competitors or my customers to know about is going to be exposed to the internet unless I pay these people off. What do I do? How do I protect? At this point, it's no longer about detection. 
but now about reaction. How can I mitigate the impact of what has happened? Hopefully, we can reach a point by using tools to never get to this stage. But this is important for us to understand the impact. Other thing, you might get emails. Again, here's an example. Dear businesses, pay two and a half Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is something like around $50,000 US now. That's $150,000 that you're paying to recover the data. That's a crazy amount of money. And this, again, it happens every day. I just talked about earlier a couple of use cases with the, the toll group, Australian transportation firm, and just recently, just this past week, Colonial Pipeline. Being attacked, being extorted for money. They don't want to pay them off because you pay them off, uh, then they're going to do it again because they know they can get money from you. How do you deal with this? How do you deal with the possibility that all this stuff is going to show up on the internet? It's going to show up on the news. The president of the United States is getting involved because your IT organization didn't do the job that could have been or should have been doing. Wow. These are the things that we want to prevent. These are the things that we need to prevent as IT organizations. And it really requires us using this multi-layered approach to really make things happen and figure things out. So ultimately, we have these challenges with our current tools. Number one is that there's a lot of information coming in terms of logs, SNMP, SNMP events. We have these scenes, these security alert managers that hopefully collate and correlate all this information. But you know what? It's still overwhelming. 70% of companies would have known that about a data breach if they had looked at all the information that they already had. It is hard to manage this data. Number two, endpoint protection and firewalls perimeter, protect, perimeter protection can be evaded. They, these hackers are smart. They're in a business and they know how to do the business. They do it well. They can bypass because they know the vulnerabilities. They know your rule set and policies. They can figure them out and find ways to avoid and evade the protections that you have installed. So having the security, the firewalls and the blocks in place is good, but it's not always 100% effective. You need other tools to see when they're still trying to get through these systems. And third is scattered footprints. They use lots of different techniques. Like I said, it's not just one thing that they're always going to do this. They're not always going to do that. They're going to do 10 different things. They're going to spread things around. They're going to hide their attacks in other pieces. For example, when we talk about DDoS, distributed denial service attacks, lots of times these DDoS attacks on networks are not to provide the dial service. They're to provide cover for the real attack to use to force you to spend your resources dealing with a DDoS attack when in reality there is another attack being slipped in underneath that you're not noticing because you don't have the time or effort to notice it. These are some of the challenges that we have to deal with in monitoring and managing our networks. And ransomware is a strong component is a huge financial motivator for these hackers. So you're going to see it a lot. You're going to run into it personally a lot with your organization. So how do we deal with these? So I'm going to pass this on to Michael. Michael, again, expert, has great knowledge with about the Flowmont Anomaly Detection System ADS in terms of identifying and helping mitigate ransomware. And Michael, I'm going to pass it to you to give us more information on what the Kemp Flumon solution can do to talk about all these issues that I discussed. Definitely. Thank you, Frank. So we have seen how the attack can usually or how usually it plays out. So I'd like to show you now how we can actually detect it in, in our network. And for the detection here, we are going to use the newest addition to the Kemp product range which is Flowmon and its great 
cybersecurity tool called Flowmon ADS, which stands for Anomaly Detection System. So first of all, what is uh, Camp Flowmon ADS? So it's a, it's a powerful detection tool that is leveraging uh, artificial intelligence and its methods like machine learning or behavior patterns or adaptive baselining or heuristics methods uh, to find anomalies um, and malicious behavior on the whole network. So it consists of 44 different methods uh, that, and few of them I'll, I'll show you uh, during the presentation and more than 200 algorithms that are constantly running and uh, they are that are looking for these anomalies on the network that usually come from inside or that can slip under the perimeter protection. So uh, during Frank's presentation, we saw several tactics that the attackers were using to spread their presence, uh, like discovery, discovery, lateral movement, collection, exfiltration, impact. And the first of them was discovery, where the attacker was looking for critical systems that he could ex access. So for this action, uh, Mm, what he did was he, he was doing port, port scanning. And that's something that we can actually quite easily uh, detect with uh, Flowmon ADS. So this first activity called port scanning left a, signi left a significant footprint in the network. And by using our behavior analysis in Flowmon ADS, we were able to indicate that there is this uh, abnormal activity. So with um, ARP scan, address resolution protocol scan, the attacker were, was able to understand which devices were around him and were, were powered on. And with a vertical TCP SYN scan, the attacker was able to make a list of all available services uh, that he can or that he could attack afterwards. So again, this is another technique that, uh, that we are able to detect inside of our solution. After the discovery, the second tactic that, that Frank showed was the, uh, the, and that the attacker is, uh, has actually used was the lateral movement. So lateral moving, movement refers to the techniques uh, that an attacker will use to move deeper into a network in search of sensitive data and other high volume assets. So after entering the network, the attacker has been, move, has been moving around through the environment and uh, ob was obtaining increased privileges using uh, various tools. So in this case, uh, the attacker found a Windows uh, remote desktop service and he tried to guess the, the password. And uh, he was not successful, so uh, he was looking for another way how to get inside, uh, which, was, uh, which are vulnerabilities. So one of the ways is uh, a recent vulnerability, which is called Blue Key. So if the device is vulnerable to this attack, attacker can get an unauthorized access. And again, this is, uh, this, and this is another activity uh, that will leave a footprint in the network. So we are able to see an attack against Windows remote desktop protocol based on behavior analysis. So now the attacker uh, is having an access to a server where he can install a keylogger. And uh, so as Frank explained, keylogger is a tool that will capture all the inputs from the keyboard, uh, which means also login and password credentials. So this is a way how the attacker can get the credentials to, a, for example, Samba server where the data can be located. And as he gets the access to the server, Next activity uh, he does is the data collection or uh, sometimes uh, referred as a data hoarding because 
he downloads a bunch of data from the server and then he can manipulate with the data. So again, this is another activity that we are able to detect with uh, Camp Flowmon ADS. For example, here we can see that two gigabytes of data have been transferred to another IP address. And one of the tactics that we can show here is also is the command and control uh, communication. So uh, we are able to detect this command and control communication between the devices and the attacker thanks to our reputation data. So whenever we know uh, that this specific IP or domain is malicious, using the reputation data that is automatically updated every six hours, we can easily detect such communication as you can, as you can see on this slide. And the next action that the attacker uh, have done uh, was the exfiltration of data. Uh, so uh, he can do it uh, in a way that mm, he just uploads the data somewhere, but uh, this could have been recognized by some basic detection tools. So uh, in our example, uh, in order to avoid it, in, in order to avoid that, the attacker did something more intelligent and he took the data file and split the data file into chunks and uh, he exfiltrated them as a part of the ICMP payload, uh, which meant basically that he pinged out the content out of the network. And uh, thanks to Camp Flomon ADS advanced mechanism, we were able to detect this activity because Again, it's very unusual and unexpected activity that ICMP traffic would have a payload. So we have an event that has been detected based on the fact that there is this payload in ICMP traffic. And as an evidence, we can do also a full, um, full packet capture that will give us a detailed evidence of this activity. Uh, the solution ADS is able to trigger the packet capture automatically when there is a significant or critical anomaly detected. So um, we don't have to do it by ourselves, but we can uh, set it up or configure it in this way that uh, one, once something critical is detected, uh, it's, it's done automatically and we can later open it, analyze it and work with it. So now the attacker has the data available because he exfiltrated them uh, out of the network via the ICMP protocol. And we are getting to the final stage, which was the, the impact. So now the attacker has the data and he needs to achieve an impact in the environment. So what he usually does is the encryption of the data. So uh, he encrypts the data on the network share and uh, he made it inaccessible and invaluable for the user. This is also an activity that leaves a footprint in the network and using our heuristic uh, analysis approach, we can detect and report on such activity. So we have recognized a suspicious Samba traffic that indicates encryption of the data. So in this stage, the, the damage has been already done and the data uh, is encrypted. So we have seen several methods where Camp Flomon ADS detected the attacker's actions. Uh, if we would mm, look at it from, from a timeline perspective, uh, we could get the impression that everything happened very fast. Uh, this was true in our demo, but in reality, such attack could take days or even weeks because the, the attacker would need to get the presence, uh, his presence in the environment. Uh, he needs to keep his persistence to do the lateral movement and he needs to collect the credentials. So this really takes time uh, and effort uh, on his side, and uh, you have over that time frame uh, the possibility to to detect these actions in their early stage with uh, Camp Flowman ADS. 
in order to understand individual techniques that the attacker uses uh, in their context. Uh, so it's not just scattered um, small detections. Uh, we have introduced the MITRE ATTACK framework or MITRE ATTACK metrics in our solution. Uh, this shows this shows in a quick and easy and easily understandable way what tactics and techniques are are used. And with few clicks, you can get from this dashboard and from this from this uh, uh, overview to a detailed uh, to a de detailed um, view uh, on each individual technique and and detection uh, that that was used. So this is a completely new feature that was uh, uh, that we have just finished and that will be released in the next month. So we are very excited about it. And it's another great evolution of our detection tool ADS. So the benefits of having a powerful detection tool are obvious. It significantly can reduce the, the risk and it can prevent breaches by identifying them. The threats are presented in, uh, in their context, and we can even record them via packet capture for a later analysis. And we can significantly reduce the impact by alerting the user in the early stage of compromise. So before we will um, end today's webinar and before we will move to the questions that you may have, um, I just would like to offer you something. And uh, if you liked what you saw today, and if you are curious how actually your network is protected, uh, what we can do for you is a free network assessment. So what this means is that we uh, can let the solution, Camflow on ADS that you have just seen, run for seven days on your network, and we will let it uh, we will let it look for vulnerabilities and threats that may be in, that may be existing in your network. And after one week, we will go through the findings together, and uh, we will we will discuss how you can actually um, increase uh, your security and seal these these gaps in your security. Um, so, if you are interested, please reach out to me or to Frank or uh, to a camp contact person and uh, that you may know and we will happily provide you this free network assessment for you frank would you like to add something regarding the network assessment or do you think that we can move to the questions yes thank you michael i think this is this is really great this network assessment because number one it's free and there's Obviously, we want you to use it more than seven days, but ultimately, it's not a, it's not just a sales pitch and sales gimmick. It's really providing you some valuable, real insights into what's going on to your network. And I've had customers, and I've talked to customers that use this uh, network assessment, and they're amazed at what they find on the network. They put it on and you start seeing results within an hour, within 30 minutes, you start seeing some really useful information. And after a week, you go back and review this and they're like, I had no idea that that machine and that server and that person's system was compromised. And there's stuff going on my network that's going there. It's like the, your eyes are opened, wide open by using this tool and getting this information. So I highly recommend there's no cost to you. There's no reason not to want to do it for you to contact us or go to, you can see the link there, kemp.ax slash network dash assessment dash trial. Sign up for this free trial. It'll give you at a minimum some really cool insights into what's going on on your network. So why don't we go ahead, Michael, and thank you very much for that really great information about overview of what this the 
Kemp Flowmon ADS anomaly detection system solution can do to help us with ransomware and these attacks and threats on our network. And let's start looking at a, a few questions here. We have a lot of cool questions. And the first one, it, I think I want to try to answer this. And Michael, you can add some color is what would you say are the best practices regarding configuration of EDR endpoint detection and response? solutions to protect ourselves against ransomware? And that's a great question because it's always a question of balance. You want it to detect as much as it can and detect everything. You want to get a 100% hit rate on all the attacks and things coming in. But the problem is you get a lot of false positives. Reducing false negatives, increasing false positives. So always this balance. And that means you're going to get a lot of logs, a lot of information saying, yeah, this was attacked and this was attacked, or this is a potential threat, when it may not quite really be. It's something that person's doing or the computer's doing something funny. So that's the challenge with all the security detect tools like endpoint detection response and firewalls and things is that how do you balance with what you're seeing versus what's real? And this is, again, where this ADR solution can really come in handy to complement because it can corroborate what these EDR solutions are telling you so that you don't have to dial it up to the point where you're getting so many alerts that you're pulling your hair out and trying to manage these threats or protect these non-threats that it's learning you about. So you really want to complement EDR with your firewall solution, with your network solution, with other tools, again, like this uh, network anomaly detection, like this uh, this ADR anomaly detection or response solution that we're talking about today. Mike, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I, I would just add regarding EDR uh, that uh, definitely uh, endpoint protection is, is, is important, but uh, you, you, cannot, mm, you cannot protect all the devices with uh, with EDR, uh, especially for example IOTs or uh, some other machines, and uh, it's uh, that's why it's so important to have a network security uh, solution, a network detection uh, solution that will be able to 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 cover uh, the whole network and uh, and uh, close these these gaps that uh, that are happening. Yes, absolutely. That's a great point. EDR can't be installed on all devices and you have a lot of devices that are potential vulnerability points. I completely agree with you, Michael. That's a great piece of information. And by the way, I have one point here. It's not a question, but I want to say at the beginning, did you hear a dog in the background? Yes, you did. That was my dog, Justice. He was uh, being a little active. So I apologize for that, but hopefully it adds a little real color to this presentation. So let's move to the next question. Is malicious behavior a signature within Flowmon that needs to be updated? Or are there heuristic or, and artif I'm going to say artificial intelligence, and it's a marketing word nowadays, but are there artificial intelligence or other sorts of things that are being done to detect this malicious behavior? Is it heuristics? Is it signatures? Is it a combination of both? How do, what is the best policy for how this works, Michael? Yeah, so we are actually working with, or the solution is working with, with several methods, and, and heuristics is one of them. So uh, we claim that this is a really powerful AI solution uh, working with machine learning or, or heuristics and, uh, and adaptive baselining. So what it does is that it actually is learning what is the usual behavior on the network. And uh, when we, when the solution uh, finds some some anomaly, uh, some abnormal activity that he that has not seen in the past, that has not learned uh, uh, in the past. Then it uh, then it detects it and and alerts you, and uh, it, so it works in this way. Awesome, yeah. And the other thing I'll add to this is that signatures are extremely helpful. To have signatures because it's it's easy. Once you get a good signature, is very efficient because you look for it, and if you see the signature, whether it's you know a text pattern or is a is a behavior pattern or whatever it is, it detects it, it alerts it. But 
a lot of these threats, like we talked about, zero day, lots of them based on different methods and now and and processes, you do need the heuristics also. So a combination of both is really required to properly detect and and help you identify this malicious behavior in your network. So let's move on. Here's a couple uh, easy ones. So the first one I'm going to ask here, and I'll do this real quick, is how and where is this data collected? So the data is primarily flow data. So your existing firewalls and network devices and things like that already can send flow data. NetFlow, IP flit, IP fix. S flow, J flow, C flow, all these different flow protocols that exist out there. And all of the data is sent to a central collector or a group of central collectors. Uh, and these collectors then take this big database and using the concept of big data and does its heuristics and pattern matching for, for signatures and everything to do what it does. But yes, there is some sort of central repository. And to cross over to an to another question, the central repository can be on your inside your network. So it can be hardware, it can be a virtual machines. It can also sit in the cloud possibly as well. It's basically a server that has the intelligence as well as the database and storage to really manage all this stuff. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah. I just want to say that really flow data uh, are, are a great source of information because it provides us uh, tons of uh, tons of uh, information about uh, which IP addresses are used and which ports and protocols are used. So by aggregating them into these flows, it kind of put it puts things in perspective. And uh, this approach is also very flexible and scalable so so we can we can cover like this uh, huge networks with several locations uh, covering um, different regions so like you said this is the primary source of information data for us uh, and then of course we we can rely on ideas signatures or uh, built-in threat intelligence that is that is constantly updated so so that's how we, for example, are able to 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 find these uh, malicious IP IP addresses and domains. Yes, and one last point that I forgot to mention is <clears throat> not only do, is flow data collected, but you can also put probes out to get a little more in depth information. So, for example, Flowmon, we have Flowmon probes which you can put on servers and install on other devices to get more in-depth layer seven packet information and flow information that gives you more context. So the richness in the information is all about the data, right? All about the data from the multiple sources, as many sources as, as far and wide into the network that you can find. So here's a good question. <clears throat> How does it handle HTTPS and traffic? In other words, if the traffic is encrypted, does it matter? And what can we do about it? Michael, do you have any insights on that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, yeah, as most of the traffic today is encrypted, uh, that, that's another reason why I think that our approach is very good because we don't have to actually decrypt it to, to understand uh, from where or to where the communication was uh, was going uh, because we extract these information from the packet header which is which is still visible for us so uh, yeah that's that's that that would be my my reply yeah and, and let me add on that looking into the packet payload is can be extremely beneficial it can be but there are two main issues that you need to think about when we talk about encrypted traffic. Number one is it requires a lot of horsepower to decrypt the traffic to do the inspection that you want to see because these encryption keys are getting pretty big nowadays. We're talking about RSA 2K, 2000-bit, uh, 2048 48-bit keys. We're talking about, uh, you know, even increasing to 4K keys. We're talking about electrical cryptography ECC and doing keys that are the equivalent of RSA 3K and 4K, 
it requires a lot of horsepower to decrypt the traffic in. It's I'm going to just say it's essentially impossible to have the horsepower to decrypt all the traffic on your network. And here's the second thing. To decrypt the traffic, you need to have the, the keys. You need to have the certificates unless you're going to brute force it. And then you have to have something, some supercomputer that, that the government intelligence agencies use and nuclear scientists use. And we certainly don't have those. So you need to have the keys and you need to be in line in the traffic. And, and this presents, as you can tell, all sorts of problems and security issues and concerns, man in the middle and things like that. So having the ability to be able to detect what is happening from a network, from a packet header, from some sort of behavior perspective is so much more efficient than having to try to and wanting to look into these encrypted payloads, which has uh, really and truly some minimal benefit. So here's one I think is definitely directed for you, Michael. Can you give some ballpark list price pricing information about what we're talking about when we're talking about wanting to implement a solution like this? Of course. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's an easy question, but still, it's it's quite hard to to give a to give an exact reply because it always depends on on the customer. Uh, it depends if we are talking about uh, securing a company with uh, 100 employees or with. Uh, 10,000 employees. So, so obviously, it depends on several factors uh, on how big is your network, uh, what uh, can we use as a source of data, if we have to deploy uh, the, the Flowmon probes or not to, to get the, the, the visibility into the traffic. Uh, so my short answer would be that it depends. But uh, if, if we should talk about some specific price, I think that in average, uh, the, the the projects that we do with our solution are around, uh, I would say, twenty five thousand euros. So, so that's not too bad. I mean, we're talking about you know, and from what I understand, the project costs can be as low as you know, for small organizations. And again, these are list prices. Every, your mileage may vary. But starting at ten thousand dollars US, or you know, that's maybe what nine thousand euros or so. I think in today's conversion rates, um, is is not a bad price when you look at the cost of these other tools that you're using to be able to to give you uh, some sort of security functionality. And the insights that this again provides is really really beneficial. So I mean, again. It, try and buy. Go to that network assessment. Do the network assessment and see if you're seeing value. And if you see any value from it, then possibly move forward. But yeah, I, I mean, the pricing is not something that you would see from your traditional overpriced security products that, because they provide, quote unquote, so much benefit. It's really providing the benefit at a reasonable uh, value for your for your environments. Yeah, so and I, I would just add that the the, the price that I mentioned, that's for a perpetual license. So uh, you may have also customers who are looking for a subscription model uh, so they kind of can rent the solution uh, in, in a virtual form, for example, for one year and then prolong it. And uh, in this way, it can be it can be also cheaper. So so there are ways actually how to how to optimize it and uh, and get a lower amount if, if that if that's an issue. Absolutely. So perpetual license, subscription models, and different types of models are certainly available for these solutions. So we, so things can be tailored to your needs and your budgets, CapEx, OpEx, et cetera. Very, very good point, Michael. So here I have a question. Does this system work as a log management system? Um, if the logs get clear, does this tool on, on your actual local systems, does this tool retain the logs? And let me provide a first pass, and Michael, and then you can add some color. This tool is not designed to be a log management system. Yes, it can collect some of that information, but it's really designed to complement and provide other tools. So log management systems and the security management system, these seams, which are these Uber collectors that really collect all their alerts from all these different systems and then provides you some sort of, cons in theory, some sort of 
concise information. This system complements those. It really does its own process to collect the information, give alerts, and then it can also pass these alerts and information that it tells into the seams and other log management systems and things like that to give you more color or more specific information. But it's really not designed to be a standalone log management system. It's really complementary. Michael, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, also, I think it's important to, to, to understand it in a way that it's a complementary solution to, to a SIEM system rather than a replacement. So uh, we, we often see customers that, for example, have an existing uh, log management system or a SIEM system. And uh, because the, the price of that solution can be also very heavy, uh, they would deploy our solution for the detection and use it as an additional source of, of information uh, for, for that SIEM system. So, which finally is, can, can save them a lot of money uh, because of the, of the licensing that, that we are able to provide. And uh, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's a slightly different approach that we have. We are not working with, with logs, but with flows. And uh, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And one last question, because <clears throat> we're running uh, short on time. Yeah. Is the solution multi-tenant capable? If I'm an MSP and if I have multiple customers, is there a way I can provide some sort of multi-tenancy with these types of solutions? Definitely. So the multi-tenancy is a feature that we have introduced uh, already some time ago and, and many customers are, are using it either uh, for themselves to, to, to kind of co have a better control over the users that are using the solution, because you can have uh, many people across the organization that will be accessing the solution. You can have uh, security guys for, from the SecOps team. You can have uh, network admins or system engineers that will also want to uh, use and leverage the, the data, the flow data that are being collected, for example, for network performance monitoring, which is another completely another topic that we have not uh, discussed, but that is also able uh, to do with this solution. Uh, so yeah, the multi-tenancy is a, is, a, is, a, is a standard feature that we have. And also we have partners, for example, that, uh, that are using this uh, solution as a as a part of their MSP offering, and uh, they kind of uh, leverage, let's say, one uh, one data storage this uh, this Flowmon collector uh, for for several customers, and they give them the access into it, or, or or they just, for example, provide them reports. So, so there are many things how we can actually work with it, and uh, so yeah. Awesome, that's great information. Thank you, Michael and. To add on to this, you mentioned NDR network uh, or NPMD type network performance detection and ma uh, management and uh, discovery and all these other cool things, DDoS mitigation. This is one really cool thing I want to just close on in terms of this flow technologies. This flow technology provides a potential wealth of information. And this is one key component of what it can do, but it can do a lot more. So definitely look at what this technology and what this ADR technology and everything and what this data can bring for you and look at, and once you start getting the core built in, you can start expanding into these other functionalities and visibility into other pieces. So that's one cool thing about Flowmon is that it does a lot of different things and it has the potential to give you a lot more insights with one tool and one technology. So I really recommend that you take advantage of it. So last thing here, yes, this link is recorded. It'll be available on demand on Bright Talk when we're done with this presentation. And I appreciate everybody joining. Uh, Michael, any last comments before we sign off here? No, no, no. I, I, I would like to just thank you for, for, the, for your presentation. It was, it was really great to see the, the attack from the attacker's perspective. And uh, I'm looking forward for, for another session together with you. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. It was great hearing you and all the great information that you provided everybody on this on this uh, webinar. 
Thank you for joining. Thank you for these great questions. Uh, we appreciate you attending this webinar. And again, it's available on demand. And please follow the Kemp channel on Bright Talk. Follow us, follow us on YouTube and LinkedIn and everywhere else. And we'll see you soon on one of our future presentations. Thank you very much, everybody.